we have a great agenda today. Um, we'll start off by sharing a few developer community updates. We'll follow that with uh, what's new here at Cerebrus. Uh, PSC and ANL will describe some of their new opportunities. And then Imad, our ML frameworks lead, will do a deep dive into what's new in our software for ML and AI developers. So starting things off with our developer community updates, I wanna let everyone know that these meetings will continue to be monthly and will cater to users of both uh, ML frameworks and our SDK. Um, additionally, we're eager to offer time during these meetings for researchers that wanna present their early research. So if you are interested, please email us at developer at cerebrus.net. Um, recently, we've launched our developer website. So if you haven't had the chance, uh, please check it out. Um, we'll be posting all developer related information here from release announcements and documentation updates to community related news. Um, <clears throat> if you have any feedback for the developer website or if there's something that you'd like to see on it, please email us again at developer at cerebrus.net. And finally, uh, we heard your feedback from the last meeting and we are going to launch a uh, forum through Discourse. Uh, this will be coming up soon. And so, yeah, once it is live, we'll be able to uh, we'll share with you that information and, and hopefully you can engage with us and each other uh, through Discourse. So I'll take this time now to give a brief update on what's, uh, what's new with our SDK. I know today's a, more of an ML meeting, but just in more of an FYI. Um, just recently, we've launched a few command line tools, um, including the CSDB or the Cerebrus Software Language Debugger, which is used for uh, interactive uh, command line debugging. We've also launched a GUI timeline functionality, which enables users to easily understand how different PEs are active and waiting with respect to one another. And in the near future, we are working on several features, one of which is a high bandwidth mem copy, which is a way for users to transfer data between the host and device without, working, without worrying about um, the route or the path. I'll take this time now to pass it off to Samia, who will give us a, uh, an update on what's new for CSOFT 1.3. Hello, everyone, and thanks, Udai. Yeah, CSOFT 1.3 release, we have uh, currently made the uh, release package available and also all our documentation and model zoo updates are ready for your use. However, a quick caveat here, we are we've still not announced this publicly or on, our, on our, any social media platforms yet. We are trying to build some momentum and planning this uh, with a larger press release somewhere around June 22nd. So appreciate if you could restrain yourself from not uh, talking about it over uh, more public platforms, but feel free to use our release. We are independently working with some of your uh, uh, some of your sysadmins to upgrade your systems to 1.3. And in the meanwhile, as ML users, like usual, you can browse through our docs, our reference implementations, and model zoo. Having said that, let's dive in. So 1.3 is a very special release for us. Uh, this is the first time we've been able to release um, GPTJ 6 billion parameter model, which supports pre-training on a single system. A single CS2 can now do uh, training from scratch and pre-training for GPTJ 6 billion. We also support the fine-tuning task specifically for the abstractive summarization fine-tuning task on GPTJ. So that's exactly the reason why we are uh, doing a little bit of uh, uh, flair and a little bit of uh, build up around this release to do our press announcement and hence the delay. Uh, on the uh, eval metrics, uh, as some of you might know who have used 1.2, we did introduce our first weight streaming release and capabilities there, but it was only for training. So 1.3 also brings capabilities to do evaluation on your models. So eval metrics are supported on GPT-2, GPT-3 Excel, as well as GPT GPT-J models. Shifting gears to PyTorch, uh, again, PyTorch, we are now moving towards enhancing and further boosting its performance. So the support for variable tensor shapes, what uh, brings in 1.3. So we are now able to support different shapes of uh, uh, different uh, shapes for the uh, tensor shapes, as well as because of this, 
it can minimize the padding and the tokens that, that you would use. So we support this for BERT, uh, TFI, and transformer models, and they're all part of our model zoo that's upgraded to 1.3. We also added support for bird fine tuning tasks in PyTorch, uh, squad classifier and summarization are the three popular tasks which we support. These are already supported in TensorFlow uh, as most of you might already know. So 1.3 brings support for these fine tuning tasks even in PyTorch. Lastly, PyTorch upgrades to the latest version of PyTorch uh, 1.11. So you're more up to date uh, with your features. And if you're using PyTorch 1.11 already and your code is in PyTorch 1.11, you can just use that code to port it into CS2 compatible and run it with all these uh, great features to boost your performance. Oh. On the multi-replica side, mainly for the small to medium-sized models, uh, we do support multi-replica mode where uh, smaller transformers and BERT models can be replicated multiple times onto our uh, wafer scale engine and leverage the data parallelism inside the wafer scale engine to speed up performance for some of the smaller models. So uh, multi-replica mode is now supported for transformer and BERT models in TensorFlow. The next 1.4 release brings the same capability with PyTorch as well. So you're not very far off if you're waiting on PyTorch. So further to just doing the multi-replica, again, the multi-replica mode also supports the variable tensor shapes uh, to bring in that additional performance boost for these small models. So the focus here is all about bringing the uh, performance, maximize the performance for small to medium uh, models in this stage. Some links on the right side here uh, to go for our docs. So docs.cerebras.net, which is public, and you can browse through all these capabilities, release notes, and, and so on. We also have released some of the reference implementations more publicly. These are sample examples, and there is an example of GPTJ as well uh, that was released in 1.3. And for more, uh, in-depth users, like our customers who are already familiar with model zoo, we have added uh, models with all different configs that support VTS, the fine tuning task, GPTJ, and eval metrics, and all of that uh, goodness there. So uh, please feel free to down, uh, download the 1.3 version of model zoo and uh, try these models out. And that's pretty much 1.3 update from my end. Thanks, Samia. Appreciate it. All right. Um, we'll now hand it off to Sergio, who can uh, give us a little talk about uh, PSC's call for proposals. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm Sergio Sanyulevich. I'm a co PI of the Neocortex project at uh, Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. And uh, we just wanted to share that uh, we plan to uh, publish or to uh, start our call. Uh, uh, our open applications for our uh, next call for proposals tomorrow, actually. So uh, uh, if you're interested, please go to the uh, web page that's linked over there. And uh, there will be details. Uh, but the timeline is we plan to open applications tomorrow and um, keep them open until July 15th. And then um, by August 15, we hope to have finished uh, reviewing the proposals and, uh, uh, and uh, get back in touch to folks. Next slide, please. So uh, this is Neocortex is an NSF project. So it has certain uh, uh, conditions or constraints uh, associated with that. Uh, so it is targeted at uh, US-based university and nonprofit researchers, but uh, uh, in gen I mean, more generally, uh, even uh, corporate folks can apply as long as um, the uh, outcome is going to be publicly available research. Uh, we will be using EasyChair as we have in the past to uh, uh, receive and process the applications. Uh, as I said, there's a five period, uh, uh, a five week period during which the applications will be uh, uh, open or welcomed. 
and uh, we will uh, start looking at them as they come in. Uh, and uh, we might uh, very well get back to proposers if we have further questions, uh, clarifications needed, specifically with regard to the mapping of what they intend to do onto the uh, capabilities of the uh, CS2 systems. Um, and that's why obviously it's important, like you guys have a leg up because you've been listening to uh, you know, the information that uh, <laughs> that is available in these meetings. Okay. Next slide, please. So uh, then, uh, as I said, uh, by mid-August, we hope to finish the review process. And then by mid-August, uh, we would onboard folks. We will give people to neocortex resources, which are, as if you don't know, there's uh, two CS2 systems front-ended by a large uh, HPE uh, SD Flex system. And, um, and then there's a login node and a slurm submit node that are part of the Bridges 2 uh, system at BSC. And also there's a, um, uh, what is also available is the uh, very large ocean uh, file systems that comes with Bridges 2. Uh, typically we provide a package, the allocation has resources on Bridges 2, uh, CPUs and GPUs, as well as on the, uh, uh, neocortex system proper, which, as I said, is the uh, SD Flex and the two CS2s. Uh, we will, uh, since uh, neocortex is a testbed project, uh, we, uh, you know, it's it's supposed to be and it will be a close collaboration and constant communication between the awarded projects, uh, PSC and Cerebras. And uh, we will have checkpoint sessions. We will have office hours. And uh, any kind of feedback, both now or questions, both now and then uh, for folks who actually get grants, uh, uh, feedback and user experiences. Uh, that's the magic email address, neocortex at bsc.edu. So that's what I had. and. Uh, I don't know if you have questions for me or we want to wait till the end. If anyone in the audience does have a question, feel free to ask it now. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you, Sergio. Appreciate it. All right, we'll uh, switch over to Bankit. Um, if you'd like to give us a little chat about um, the AI testbed. Sure. Uh, thanks again for having me here today. I'm Venkat Vishwanath from the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility at Argonne National Laboratory. Uh, and I'll talk briefly about our uh, AI testbed. If you could go to our next slide. So Argonne uh, Leadership Computing Facility uh, is a US Department of Energy Office of Science uh, uh, leadership facility where we offer computing resources to the open science community. Our users span uh, universities, national labs, uh, uh, industry, uh, spanning uh, both uh, US space as well as worldwide. So we get uh, researchers who work on open science research that would like to use large scale computing resources that uh, target our systems. Uh, you know, we are currently deploying Aurora, uh, which has a peak of uh, two exaflops. And we are really excited. Our, our sister facility at Oak Ridge really hit the one exaflop barrier at uh, ISC this year. So, you know, great times for uh, computational science at scale. So, uh, next slide, please. So, if you start looking at uh, our supercomputing systems, we are working to really facilitate simulation learning and analytics at scale on these systems. Um, as we um, you know, chart towards this uh, path, we are also having exciting and novel architectures such as Cerebra, Sambanova, GraphCore, Gra, Habana, among others that are providing tremendous acceleration for 
AI as well as HPC workloads as well. Um, you know, you've heard about the CS soft that uh, Cerebras has. So our goal at ALCF is to really understand um, the efficacy of uh, accelerators and novel accelerators for scientific machine learning. And how do we really architect future supercomputers for science on using these systems? Um, so if you uh, click next, uh, would I? Yeah. So we have uh, we have created an AI testbed which spans multiple set of accelerators where our goal is to really identify and help understand their efficacy for uh, science. Today, uh, we have Cerebrus and Samanova that's available for allocations. And we hope uh, we have other internal systems that we hope to make them ready for allocations uh, going forward. In the CS2 system, you've had a really good collaboration with Cerebras. We had a CS1 system earlier. We learned, uh, um, you know, we had a good experience over there. We've scaled it out to have, uh, you know, uh, two nodes of CS2. Uh, we've got really exciting science that have come out from these systems and a number of publications. Um, just to highlight a couple, um, there's a, a, a 2021, uh, Garden Bell finalists that leverage the CS2 to really accelerate some um, protein-protein interaction learning problems that we have. Uh, we've got some very novel acceleration using this, uh, the CS2 system for uh, some of the, uh, I would say, uh, image reconstruction work that we're doing uh, in collaboration with uh, APS. And we're seeing really good improvements for some of the cancer workloads that we've also that we run on this CS2. Um, so the Cerebras and Sapanova system are available for allocations and I'll next talk about uh, how someone could get access to it. So if you click to, to the next page, um, at ALCF, we have the Director's Discretionary Award that provides, uh, provides you with access to the systems. Um, you can apply for, um, for this on an ongoing basis. So we, we don't have any deadlines. Uh, we usually have a turnaround of two to three weeks from when you apply uh, to making a decision and getting you going. So as and when you're ready to run on a system, uh, we welcome you to apply for this. The duration for allocations are three to six months and we, we constantly renew them as well based on progress that you've made on an ongoing allocation. Again, uh, anyone from academia, industry, government agencies, working on open science can apply for this. Um, and uh, uh, and the, the teams can span worldwide researchers over here. Here's a direct link that you can go. It takes, uh, I would say, 15 minutes to, um, to fill out the form. You'll get. You'll be asked about your application. You'll be asked about information about your models, if you have run uh, currently, um, or what kind of development are you planning to do. Uh, if there are questions that we have, we will definitely come and ask for you. So it's a very, I would say, uh, it's a process. It's an easy process to get get you access and up and running on our systems here. Um, so we we really welcome good, interesting, challenging scientific machine learning applications where uh, which really stress these systems and um, uh, come up with novel discoveries. So thanks again for having me. Happy to answer any questions. There's a link over there to go and apply for the uh, director's allocation program. And you can always reach out to support at ALCF or even reach out to me at venkat at anl.gov and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Venkat, appreciate it. And yeah, if there are any questions, um, you know, feel free to ask them now. And again, um, as Venkat said, there's a, an email there for you to email to if you wanna ask questions later. All right, now to the main attraction, uh, Imad, um, 
we'll let you uh, introduce yourself and kick kick this uh, deep dive off. Okay, thanks, Saidi. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Imad Barsoom. I lead the AI framework team at Cerebrus. Uh, so I'll, I'll, uh, I am happy to meet all of you. So, and I will give you a little introduction about the current architecture and how we enable uh, PyTorch uh, uh, to train and uh, take advantage of Cerebrus capability. Uh, next, today. Also, feel free to ask any question uh, 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 during, the, uh, during the talk, yeah. So uh, currently, the goal of the AI framework uh, uh, or the, uh, uh, for us is to be able to support multiple framework and take advantage of all the hardware capability of Cerebrus okay. without much overhead to the user. And that's what we are trying to strive on it. So, so, so we are we having a unified backend. Uh, the goal of the unified backend is to be to be able to be general, support most models that can be expressed by PyTorch and TensorFlow and maybe other framework in the future such as JAX. Uh, be able to uh, support most of the framework capability as much as possible without uh, without with very little constraint as possible. Easy to debug and have the capability to add more framework without, uh, uh, with, without much um, uh, complexity. One of the advantage of Cerebrus is that it acts as a single plus, as a cluster in a single ship. And we are trying to make sure to, to make Cerebrus act as a single accelerator device, which as most of you familiar with training with multiple GPU and multiple accelerator, how that affects the effect of any batch size, how that adds some complexity to the training, even it can affect the conversion itself. And this is the thing that we are trying to avoid and make Cerebrus even that it's, uh, it's it's act as a uh, cluster in a single ship to act as a single accelerator so that you can train it as if you are training on a single GPU. Also, uh, we, we have some API exposed uh, user facing API that help the user to move their model uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, from, uh, uh, to the Cerebrus, take advantage of the Cerebrus uh, capability. Uh, guys, please, uh, please mute. Uh, uh, guys, there is a lot of background noise, so please mute. So, so, so we are trying to make sure that those API have uh, as little constraint as possible and make sure we uh, over, uh, less overhead for the user uh, to ramp up or learn a new capability. Uh, we start with new set of API for PyTorch and we evolve those and we will also do the same for TensorFlow. Also, we, we support training evaluation and inference workflow, uh, uh, profiling and estimation data requirement and this I will talk detail what that means, especially because of the hardware is is uh, is extremely fast. So we need to make sure we don't starve it from the data pipeline uh, itself. One of the big challenge, okay, how to accelerate any model from very small to extremely large uh, model, and because every customer have different requirement, different uh, different need, and we need to make sure to scale from small to large model. We talk about it also. Uh, also, we try to avoid reinventing the wheel and have always proprietary solutions. So a lot of our work, actually, we are contribute and leverage the open source community and, and also attend conference and present what we are doing. I will talk about some of the effort in this regard. Next. Okay. So let's start as a focus of this process in PyTorch. I will talk about some of the similarity of the back end or uh, between PyTorch and TensorFlow, but I will focus in PyTorch because it's uh, what new in our uh, re uh, releases. So PyTorch is favored by a lot of academia and a lot of uh, user because it, it acts as a PyTorch library, sorry, as a Python library pretty much. What that mean? It does, uh, you don't need, uh, it does not provide a DSL or domain specific uh, language on the top of Python that you need to learn. You don't construct a graph manually uh, without if, uh, without looking inside it and then try to compile and run it, which huge advantage for the customer, but of course a huge challenge for us to accelerate because you can, Python is very, very general language and you can write any uh, uh, complex uh, code with, with Python. So the way that we, 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 we support PyTorch, we follow the same approach that Google and Meta co collaboration did to support in TPU, which is the lazy tensor. The idea here is simple. As long as you write PyTorch code, we'll not execute it unless you need the output. And while you're writing the code, 
we do, uh, we generate a gra graph in the background, a quick graph, which what we call tracing. And once you finish code and start training, this graph will be compiled and run into our hardware. So this is what lazy tensor means. The tensor is lazy evaluated. It is evaluated only when you need the output. So uh, uh, a PyTorch tensor library is called A10. So we so the lazy tensor generate an A10 graph for PyTorch. This graph, uh, our backend is based on MLIR. MLIR is a multi-level IR dialect was created by Google, uh, uh, Chris Lanter from Google uh, and Uday a couple of years ago. And it's enabled us to leverage multiple IR and give us a nice infrastructure for debuggability and for generability and a lot of other future feature. So, we, so our backend use MLIR for our own IR. So the first thing, once we get the graph from PyTorch, uh, in A10 graph, we needed to we lower it to MLIR A10. Then we lower that to our own IR. Our IR we call it Sir H, which is Cerebrus IR high. Why we call it IR high? Because it's the same abstraction as NumPy, as A10, as TensorFlow, Tensor API. So it's high level. It have convolution up. It have for the uh, uh, mal up. It have high level up that user expect to see it from the framework itself. This enable us to be pretty much agnostic to the framework and agnostic to the variation between framework. Currently, we piggyback on the TPU backend because that's the only, after discussion with Facebook Meta, that's the only thing that is ready. But we, we are working for the future with Torch MLIR community and we are contributing to it. And to PyTorch are moving lazy tensor to be in core PyTorch. However, that shouldn't affect you as user from using the Cerebras backend because the API will be the same, but at least the, the internal will change and moving to core PyTorch. However, so, so the goal here, so we lazy tensor, we trace and track the entire graph of your model. We, we generate a graph, we lower it to our own IR, and after that, uh, this IR is the same between PyTorch and uh, uh, TensorFlow and any other framework will be support. This is our contract, this is our interface between the external world and the internal world. Any question? Next, please. Okay, so now that we get Sir H, so as you see here, what we get from PyTorch, regardless of how we get it, is A10 graph, and we lower to Sir H. TensorFlow is the same. What we get from TensorFlow is graph def, and we lower to Sir H. From Sir H to below, it's, it's common for every framework we support. So once we get Sir H, uh, Sir H graph, uh, we have our own handwritten kernel. Those are written in low level uh, uh, assembly for, for Cerberus. Take advantage of the multi-core of the SRAM of all the capability of the, uh, uh, of the parallelism of, of uh, Cerebrus uh, ship uh, uh, and take advantage of all the capability of the ship to make sure it, it, it's, it's super fast. This is equivalent to Kodian and on NVIDIA and other library in other fr um, framework. Of course, those don't map one-to-one -one with Sir H. Those usually are fused up with written with high performance to avoid any intermediate result. So those cannot cover all the model. So the first step, what we do once we have a Sir H graph, we do graph rewrite. The graph rewrite is that simply we, we uh, pass this is simply we fuse a lot of nodes in the graph and replace them with a single super node. This super node map one to one with our list of kernel. And then we replace them with our kernel. So we try as much as possible, we replace most of the graph to, to, uh, with our handwritten kernel, kernel because this is uh, the highest performance that you can get. Of course, we cannot support all possible combinations that exponential. So, so if there is no leftover, that's great. We can compile and run to Cerebus. However, if there is a leftover node, which uh, the nodes that don't, don't belong to any uh, of the handwritten kernel, that we lower them to a more primitive dialect uh, called a fine dialect. The affine dialect is much more uh, smaller in terms of size compared to Sir H, compared to PyTorch op, 
compared to tensor flow up, it's a more mathematic operation and uh, 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 lower level mathematic operation. And we use a, a, a polyhedra compiler optimization to generate kernel for them. So we get a search graph from, in, from the framework that we support. Then we do graph rewrite to replace a big chunk of this graph with a bunch of kernel, uh, high performance kernel that we have in our library. And this uh, list of high performance kernel, we keep extending them for more model, more bottleneck, and more important uh, part of the model, such as attention block and others. Then any leftover node, we lower to affine, we cluster, we then run our compiler to generate kernel for them using polyhedra optimization, and we keep improving our compiler generated to uh, for performance for um, memory footage and others uh, uh, to to improve uh, 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 to be able to and to be more general for any complex mathematic expression. Once the compiler phase finish, we get what we call a kernel graph. Kernel graph that means it's it's a graph that it's ready to be compiled and run on the wafer. This sent to the place and route phase. Uh, as you know, uh, Slibris wafer is not von Neumann, it's data flow. We actually lay out each of the kernel in the wafer. So the place on right look at, uh, and route to look at each of the kernel, the description of the kernel, what memory require, uh, for fed compute requirement estimate and all that to be able to place all the kernel uh, in the wafer in the most optimal way possible. Uh, and and this after place and route we can compile it to our executable uh, executable and run it on the wafer itself. Any question? Okay. So what that give us the combination of handwritten kernel and auto generated kernel? The goal uh, that should give us a a, a huge um, a, a, a a good foundation to be general for any model. Uh, we cannot simply have a, a, a handwritten kernel for any combination of model. But once we load to primitive, we can generate most of them using our compiler generator. So we so the handwritten kernel are focused on the building blocks that are needed for performance, and the generated kernel is focused on all the flexibility to be able to support any model, any dynamic, uh, any change of expression. For example, schedule learning rate uh, and and other expressions that you can add in loss. And so we can express with with a uh, auto generated kernel. Auto generated kernel are fast, are not slow, and we keep improving it from uh, each each release. Any question? Okay, next please. Uh, before yeah, so what we talked about so far is a compiler phase. We need to extract all the information from the model, compile it, and this of course cache. So you can use it. You can compile offline multiple model and then start running. However, the training itself, how it's done. One of the things that we are trying, we are not trying to create our own tool as much as possible, because creating our own custom tool, which we do if needed, uh, mean extra learning from you. So we are trying to leverage what existing and be pretty much out of the way. So what? So we support TensorBoard in PyTorch and in uh, uh, TensorFlow. Uh, this is most researcher and user standardized on TensorBoard to, to be able to visualize the loss, the metric, and all, uh, pretty much any tensor output from the model you can visualize. Of course, if you, are, if you generalize all the tensor output, even dense tensors, the performance will be bad because it's network accelerator and this data need to be moved back and forth uh, from, uh, uh, need to move back from the system uh, to the worker. Uh, as a current architecture, we have our system connected to multiple worker nodes that stream data to the system. And the reason that we need multiple input worker nodes to keep the system busy. We don't wanna starve the system during training and this is a bottleneck. And we have shift worker per system. The shift worker responsible is the communication with the CS2 directly, be able to, uh, to manage the worker and communicate back and forth. All losses and metric are received by the shift worker from the system and are dumped into log that can be visualized by tensor board. Also, the number of worker you can manually overwrite and specify, but I will talk about it that we can also auto specify them for you based on profile and estimate. 
another thing also, um, the checkpoint for both PyTorch and TensorFlow is the standard checkpoint of the framework. We are, uh, so you can train in, uh, in Cerebrus and evaluate on the GPU, or you can start on small model. Uh, you can start on small data on the GPU to test your model and then move it to Cerebrus. So, so we are trying as much as possible to be compatible uh, with, with the standard PyTorch and TensorFlow uh, model uh, as much as possible. Any question? Okay, next, please. Okay, as we said, uh, it will be very bad if you have CS2 and you, are uh, and, and you are not taking advantage on it or you are starving the pipeline because simply uh, the CS2 is much more faster than the, than the flow of data coming into CS2. So the way that we deal with that is we have multiple nodes in your cluster that keep reading data in parallel and send those data sample by sample to CS2 to keep it busy. The FPGA on CS2 marks those data together and send it to the model. So how? So of course that brings a question: How many worker we need? Of course you can do a try and error by by try uh, by try keep trying uh, changing the n number of worker and see if the system is starving or not. But that will take forever and it's uh, it's not a good user experience. What we do, we have a, a profiler script or tool. You run it based on the model complexity and the data set and the data throughput. It will set or tell you how many workers it needs to take full advantage of the current model on training. This tool, we keep improving it from each releases. We keep collecting more data. And also, we are looking at, at moving the algorithm to decide how many workers you need from uh, heuristic to more data driven and actually train a model to uh, to to specify the optimal uh, 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 number of worker uh, needed and as fast as possible so using data based approach we can do it in, uh, uh, in much more faster as a tick like 30 second or so on to estimate good amount uh, uh, what then how many worker needed to train your model any question okay next please okay uh, as I said at the beginning, so we are trying as much as possible to reduce the learning overhead for the user that might try to learn a new API. However, because we are network accelerator, architecture is totally different than uh, GPU and, and CPU, we need to provide some extra API. We are uh, evolving our API, so it's different what we have in tested flow, and we are evolving also the tested flow one. We are moving away from having uh, a trainer-like API or estimator-like API that, that, that hide everything. So the way that we are trying to do, we are trying to make sure our API is add-on on your custom code. For example, in, if you look at, the, uh, uh, at uh, the code on the right, the model class is your standard PyTorch model that you, you, you are familiar with and love. The only API that you need is from CBTorch namespace. You just initialize the, the wafer. This is where you specify also the IP address of your CS2. Uh, you, you, you wrap your data loader. The data loader, if you see inside, is simply that standard Torch data loader, nothing custom, nothing special. And also, you wrap your, your model, which you inherit from an N module. And the only thing extra you need is to wrap your training loop with the session and provide your model optimizer and criterion, which is your loss. However, the inside of it is simply your standard loop. Because we use still some of the TPU backends, there is some extra API like the add stack closure and other. Those, hopefully, in the future, once the code uh, is in core PyTorch, we plan to move, uh, uh, we plan to simplify the API further and move, move away from that. However, the code, uh, most of the code, like your loop and your model, uh, are, are the same as standard PyTorch model, nothing special. That being said, there is some constraint you need to be aware of. We are network accelerator, so running on the CPU is too costly. Uh, a lot of code in PyTorch in the wild, they have a lot of Python code and NumPy code. Uh, those code if, uh, doesn't show in the tracing because are not torch.code. So the restrictions that we have is that any code in your model need to be torched too, so we can capture the graph. Pretty much, if you use a Python logic or NumPy logic, it's invisible to us. 
we are trying to we have some idea how to handle those uh, by uh, by wrapping them and be able to parse them but we don't have that yet but at least uh, uh, we need uh, we need a way to uh, to be able to get extract the the entire graph uh, from uh, from the, the uh, from from the model so so any logic in python need to be changed uh, to to use uh, torch dot or torch and an api dynamic graph if the topology change based on data that's mean recompile which is pretty slow process uh, so so you should try to avoid that however we support some dynamism that uh, as uh, somia alluded at the beginning about vts which is variable tensor shape this is we have two custom of in pytorch you specify which access with a mask to specify the, the the variable of each of the access uh, as a length of each of the access so you don't need padding like in on the gpu or other accelerator when you have variable length sequence and you get performance boost on cerebrus on 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 that so we have some dynamic support but this is not topology if the topology change then it need to recompile any question hey Matt, yeah we got one in the chat yeah. um, dennis asks when do you plan to add convolutional layers to the pytorch api that's a great question so we are working on a vision model uh, 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 is, uh hopefully will come soon but uh, uh, but we are working on vision model like unit and other and we expect to coming hopefully uh, in uh, 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 i i don't know uh, but but hopefully soon like uh, currently we have uh, by by maybe uh, 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 hopefully july or august but we are working on that yeah fall 22 yeah Next, please. Any other question? Okay. okay, as I said, one of the challenges that we have, okay, we have a huge ship that act as a, a cluster on a single uh, ship. Of course, it's very difficult to optimize a small model and how to optimize a large model that does not fit in the ship. So the way that we do it, if you model have underutilized the ship or too small for the ship, we simply treat the ship as a cluster and do data parallelism. This happened behind the scene. So this happened at the compiler phase without the user know about it. Uh, so this has, the way that we do it, we replicate the model across the ship. If you see the screenshot here, it's one of the models that get replicated 80 times. And we, as this is the same model, get we, we partition the sh ship and the same model get replicated 80 times and we do data parallelism However, the auto, uh, the O reduce on between all those replica is extremely fast because it's done within the ship fabric communication. It's not done like a between multiple node. And this happened, you don't need to change your model. This happened at the compilation stage, automatic, we do that on your behalf. And you get, depend on the model, you get 10X plus acceleration. And this gives us huge performance boost on small model and utilize more the wafer. So, so for small model that can be replicated, we do what we call multi-replica, in which we replicate the model across the wafer so that we speed up the performance. Next, please. Uh, yeah, okay. What about, so our wafer has 40 gig of SRAM. Of course, that's great for a lot of model like uh, GPT-2, medium, BERT, large, and the others, but we, we see that our uh, models that are billion and billion of billion parameter. So how we deal with such a model? This is what uh, Sean, our founder, announced in, uh, in hot ship, and this is what we call weight streaming mode. Uh, in this mode, the weight are not saved into the wafer. So uh, we have a separate compute, which we call memory X. This compute hold all the weight, and this can extend it to multiple compute and also to multiple CS2. We stream because the architecture of Cerebra CS2 is data flow. We stream the weight to the system. While we stream the weight, we compute the forward pass and the gradient, and then the stream the gradient back to the optimizer compute unit, which applies the gradient to the weight. And we do that in pipeline fashion so that does, uh, so the overhead reduce. We also, the communication between the optimizer compute 
and the wafer uh, are extremely fast and we also uh, have our own custom protocol uh, to be able to handle sparsity handle uh, and and be able to compress and be able to uh, uh, handle the weight size this enable us to scale to a billion of billion of parameter and the 40 gig ram on 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 it will only hold the model without the weight itself so it should in theory hold a, a extremely large model so the way that we are doing here for weight streaming is simply if the model too large to fit on a single chip we simply don't store the weight there we stream the weight to uh, to the wafer and then stream the gradient back and apply it uh, uh, the, uh, the, the the, the gradient to the weight in the compute optimizer compute and using this architecture we can actually have multiple cs2 together if you have extremely large model and you you want to scale uh, a scale as uh, you want to scale uh, 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 speed up uh, extremely large model you can have multiple cs2 and 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 the weight can be partitioned to all of them can be streamed uh, to all of them and we can do a, a data parallelism like approach to uh, to update the weight uh, i see that this question pop up so okay. yes uh Hien Siang asks is the weight streaming shares bandwidth with the input pipeline is that a great question uh, no so as a weight streaming is connected directly is a as a wood streaming, uh, it's connected directly separate from the input pipeline. But Imad, essentially, we have a single 1.2 terabits per second uh, to stream both ways and inputs. So in a sense, they do share uh, the connectivity. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah sorry for that. Yeah. So, so uh, this is Harry from R1. So basically, the the weight and uh, optimizer state in one of one of the nodes, right? One of the cluster, either chip node or some worker node, uh, and then the bandwidth will be shared. Is that correct understanding? So we have only uh, one point two terabits per second um, I/O bandwidth into the system. So that 1.2 terabits per second will be shared between streaming weights and uh, streamed uh, data. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Next, please. Okay. Uh, also, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we, we, we uh, our team contribute to TensorFlow and PyTorch. We also, because our back end is depend on MLIR, we, we, we attend the community meeting, we contribute to MLIR, we contribute to large feature on PDL, which an MLIR dialect for graph rewrite, so that enable us flexibility for complex graph rewrite. And, uh, and we also present our work uh, in multiple uh, relevant conference uh, for ML. Next. Uh, for more information, we have multiple blocks about the current architecture of PyTorch, uh, how to start off BERT training on PyTorch, uh, white paper on which things. There are also more block items in our website, so please feel free to go through them. The documentation of PyTorch, here's a link also. Okay. So let's have some uh, discussion. Yeah, uh, uh, please. I yeah so please feel free to add in the chat uh, uh, what domain you are working on or what domain you are planning to work on in the future uh, 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 nlp speech vision recommender or any other domain that you are interested in and please uh, put it in the chat next just a quick note to our audience um if you have questions for anything that Imad brought up or um if you'd like to contribute to you know our understanding um we're going to go through a series of uh questions now and um yeah you don't need to um, put it anywhere or organize it just enter your your thoughts in the chat and um you know we'll sort and filter so our first discussion topic is uh what domains are you working on or plan on working on in the future um, we've provided a couple examples, but um, please don't feel yourself limited to them.
All right. Um, we'll go to the next topic as well. Um, what types of models are you are you currently or will be working with? Um, so again, you know, we've provided. Uh, Francisco, yes, you can ask questions now. Um, feel free to hop on the mic or type it in. Oh yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Oh yeah, cool. So um, uh, my name is Francisco McGee. Um, I, 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 I work on proteins, I do uh, protein generation AI. And so um, I guess I was just kind of wondering, um, do you guys have um, support yet for like GPT and GPT like models? Yeah, yeah, uh, yes, uh, yes, we have GPT-2 support. Yeah, hi, Francisca. Yes, we do support uh, GPT-style models. Uh, for small to medium-sized models, we support it in our pipeline uh, mode of execution where the whole model fits on the wafer scale and the data gets streamed. But for larger uh, models where the whole model doesn't fit on the wafer scale, uh, something like the GPT-3 Excel with 1.3 billion parameters or more recently, the GPT-J model with 6 billion parameters, we support them through the weight streaming execution mode. And our latest release, the 1.3 uh, upgrade, uh, brings support for GPT-J6 billion models as well as GPT-2 and GPT-3 Excel. And we continue to work on these large scale models and we plan to add support for much larger models in our upcoming releases. Okay, cool, that sounds good, thank you. Yeah, and the best way to try them out is we have our reference implementations of these uh, models, both on our model zoo, if you already have access to it, but on publicly available uh, reference implementations repo, it's a public GitHub repo where we expose a few of our examples currently because our model zoo is not public yet. So you could also browse in that uh, uh, public repo and the link I think Rebecca posted on the chat here. Okay, cool. For the for the GPT stuff, is there like um, is there a preference on the Cerebrus side or the or, or the PSC side with respect to um, uh, PyTorch or TensorFlow or just equal support for both with respect to the GPT? Yeah, so uh, most of this is supported on both uh, PyTorch and TensorFlow. However, with GPT-J and some of the extreme scale models, PyTorch support is coming up in our uh, next releases, but uh, most GPT-2 style and small to medium sized models uh, are supported both in PyTorch and TensorFlow. Okay, so just to clarify, you said that for GPT-3 and GPT-J, it's gonna only be for PyTorch. Uh, no, it's producing? going to be only for TensorFlow today. Oh, and then you're gonna do PyTorch later. Later, yeah. yeah. In the okay. upcoming one or two releases, we should have them supported in PyTorch as well. Yeah, we are working are on them for PyTorch. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I, I, again, for GPT three and GPT J, uh, uh, there's support in there for TensorFlow only right now. Right. Is that correct. Yes. Okay. Perfect. If you want to try them today. Uh, hi, uh, this is Nicholas Tice. Um, I just have a specific question about GNN models. Um, do you know on the model zoo, it looks like there was a binary classification task implemented. Do you know if they will be able to do regression tasks? Would that maybe be limited by the kernel functions or is it just... Uh, uh, a regression task for just uh, graph property regression instead of classification should work. Okay, cool. So if that's the only change that we are doing, that that works and we had some internal tests uh, or some other customer use cases with regression instead of classification. Okay, so that's been done. All right, great. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, this is Francisco. I had another question about um, TensorBoard. Um, I was just kind of curious. Um, is like, I saw that TensorBoard is being used, but I was just wondering: um, Are there any limitations to um, 
what type of things people are allowed to do with TensorBoard or, I mean, what type of things are supported for people to do with TensorBoard or is it just like everything that's in TensorBoard is available up to some, you know, release or something like that? Uh, it depends what kind of bit you are talking about. So we, we improve TensorBoard in such a way you, you can actually, uh, 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 extract any tensor from the model, but that might slow down. Are you talking about visualizing the model? Or what feature are, uh, uh, are you, yeah, are, are you I, interested in? I guess in? what I had in mind was like real-time monitoring and visualization, um, like while the model is actually running. Well, you should be able to real-time monitor the losses uh, if that's what to ask on it, right? And the metric, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's that's basically. I I, yeah, I just yeah. know that it has, you know, TensorBoard can create sort of like dashboards that you can use to monitor your model as it's running. And I was just kind of wondering if that's actually something that's available available and supported um, on the Neocortex system. But it sounds like the answer is yes, right? Yes, the answer is yes. 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 Perfect. We internally you. use TensorBoards to monitor yeah, all yeah, the yeah. I'm trying cool. to understand if you are meaning something else by dashboard, but yes, you should be able to monitor real time loss and metric. Yeah. And what about what about like custom metrics? Is that available too, or is it just the built in things that they have available in TensorBoard, like loss and validation loss, etc.? I believe it's possible for uh, um, some kind of custom metrics. Yeah. We had implemented some custom monitoring through summaries and through host calls. So yeah. we'll need to look, it, it, it is possible, but if you want to bring very large tensors out of their um, accelerator, there might be some challenges with that. Mm -hmm. So okay. uh, Francisco, I would just add that, you know, uh, working on uh, neocortex, uh, you know, get in touch with us if you uh, have, you know, if you want to do that. And, uh, you know, Natalia's team and our team will be happy to uh, answer your questions, office hours, whatever, to, to uh, like actually get to the bottom of it. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Just finally, uh, you know, to uh, uh, finish the discussion about GPT-3 and GPT-J, that does require version 1.3, correct? Yeah, with GPT-3XL 1.3 billion parameters, that support is available on the 1.2 release as well. Oh, okay. For GPT-J, that's in 1.3. Okay, thank you. Great, well, if we are if we're out of questions, um, then I'll, I'll just say thanks to everyone for taking time today to attend our developer community meeting. Um, um, you know, as always, if you do have questions, feel free to email us at developer at cerebrus.net. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in the next meeting. Thank you, everyone. You have a great day. Yeah.